Uh, my name is Reverend Dr. Alfonso Wyatt. I'm a board member uh, with the M Faith Center of New York and a uh, former vice president of the Fund for the City of New York. It is with great honor uh, that I act uh, in the role of, of moderator. Uh, the one who everybody is going to start out liking and by the end of the night end up saying, where did they get him from? My job is to keep the train moving, the train of thought, the train of energy. And I have to follow a schedule that was given to me. And it is, it is rather ambitious, but I believe with cooperation, uh, we will be able to, to move through. It is my pleasure um, to, as I said, moderate the uh, Manhattan DA Candidates Forum um, to hear from underserved and over-policed communities. Uh, we have on hand uh, the Interfaith Center of New York, Circles of Support, and Dawi Sarinj Gruba, Exodus Transitional Community, and we will follow this format. There will be a question that will be given uh, to the candidates. I will read your names uh, the first time uh, in alphabetical order. If you get a little confused, just think of where you are in the alphabet um, and uh, you can respond. You have uh, a minute to respond to uh, the series of questions that will be posed uh, by folk from the community. So with that said, I turn it over to Reverend Chloe and she'll take it from there and lead us with prayer. Good evening. Thank you so much to all the candidates um, for whom this is, must be your, your first um, online um, Zoom forum, right? <laughs> okay, good, just checking. Um, and to all the participants uh, and those who will be asking questions and those who will be listening and also asking questions on the chat. So please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, lover of all peoples, you are known by many names. When you speak, there is light and life. When you act, there is justice and love. Visit, we pray, the cities of the earth. Be here with us in New York. Help us to renew the ties of mutual regard that form our civic life. Send us honest and able leaders. Help us eliminate poverty, prejudice, and oppression, that peace may prevail with righteousness and justice with order, and that men and women from different cultures and backgrounds may find with one another the fulfillment of their humanity. Amen. Amen. And now we'll have the welcome by Julio Medina, uh, Executive Director of Exodus Transitional Community. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, Julio from East Harlem. Um, and I'm here at Exodus. Uh, for the past 22 years, uh, we have been an anchor in our community. Uh, we service over 3,000 people a year that are involved in the justice system. Uh, um, today in our audience, I have a small group of community, staff, and youth members anxiously awaiting to hear the plans the candidates have around justice. I want to thank Manhattan DA candidates in advance for your commitment to equal and unbiased justice and your overall reinvestment in our communities. So I thank you all. Now, Ms. Yeah. Austin will come forward. Hi, good evening, everyone, and shalom. My name is Minister Only Love Chica Austin, and I'm the Racial Justice Organizing Fellow at the Interfaith Center of New York. I am also a minister of Prophetic Whirlwind Ministries, a Messianic Hebrew ministry, and we want to thank all of you for being here tonight. We want to thank the candidates and the community partners and the racial justice work of the Interfaith Center of New York 
during this important election cycle. I am so sorry. Um, but the racial justice work that the Interfaith Center of New York is embarking upon is to make sure that the full diversity of New York City's faith community is engaged in this major election. This election is going to decide the next possibly decade of our city. So we are one of the oldest and most diverse um, religious justice organizations in the city, organizing throughout the Abrahamic faiths, the African faiths, the Hindu and Buddhist faiths. And we truly are trying to move people off, off of the pews and prayer mats and into public life. So this is one of a couple of forums that we will be having. We will be having two mayoral candidate forums, organizing meetings with faith leaders so that we can put out a bold racial justice platform for New York City and then organizing after the elections to make sure that that platform comes to pass. And so we really think everyone who is here tonight, just some housekeeping rules. This is being recorded and we have many who have registered on Zoom, but this is also being live streamed on the Interfaith Center of New York's Facebook page. So please follow us. And if you want to post about this forum, you can use hashtag ICNY racial justice or hashtag New York City elections 2021. Now there are some friends that I want to acknowledge um, who are with us tonight from the faith and justice community. And if you give me a moment. So I want to acknowledge Reverend Dr. Gwendolyn Hall from the MICA Institute. She's the education co-chair. Ruth Messenger, who is um, a longtime leader in our city. Alex Tyndall Weisendanger, who is the board chair for the New York Council of Churches and also the father to my godchildren. Um, Genevieve Diedrich from Trinity Wall Street. Reverend Dr. Clyde from the MICA Institute Steering Committee. Lucas Parishin from Trinity Wall Street. And we also, and if we have forgotten you, please um, be patient, but we do wanna shout out some of the organizations. Hofstra University, Legal Aid Society, thank you for all your work, Legal Aid on Right to Remain Silent, Network of Support Services, New um, representatives from the New York State Assembly, Pax Christi, 100 Black Women, Children's Defense Fund New York, Our Children, Vocal New York, the MICA Table, New York City Presbytery, the Diocese of Albany, New York, and Well Cornell Medical Center, and of course, our houses of worship, such as Trinity Wall Street, St. James Presbyterian Church, St. Mary's Episcopal Church of Manhattanville, Episcopal Church of the Incarnation, Manhattan, St. Philip's Church, the Religious Society of Friends, Salam United Methodist Church, and Ecclesia Ministries, of New York. So we thank you all for being with us. And we are, we hope that those of you who are joining will um, work with us and organize with us to make sure we have racial justice in our city. And so I will turn it back over to you, Reverend Wyatt. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank all of those who thought it not robbery to uh, support uh, this effort. Um, our job is to find out more about you. Our job is to listen. Our job is to not just listen passively, but actively. So our first uh, uh, questioner um, is from Bronx Connect, Brother Kawan Lankos uh, from Bronx Connect, and he will pose the first question. I will call out for the first time the order of that we will proceed and answer. And it is, as I mentioned, in alphabetical uh, order. Brother Lankos, would you come forward and pose your questions to the candidates, please? Salutations, everybody. It's greetings, one and all. How y'all doing this great day? Um, my name is Kwan Land Close. You know, I'm a worker for Bronx Connect and uh, um, Cure Violence Program for Call RTG, Release the Grip. Um, just to get a little bit into who I am, not to take up too much time. Um, I'm a 23-year-old working very hard in the community to make the community better, but, you know, see the change for tomorrow, you know? 
to make sure everything is great. So um, just to give you a little insight of my life, you know, when I was 13 years old, you know, I was taken by police, you know, um, without my, you know, just snatched off the street at the age of 13. I was um, beaten multiple times by the police officers that took me off the street. Um, I'm with the Right to Remain Silence campaign all the way. I'm here to say that, you know, um, me and my other brothers and sisters in arms that we hit every day, you know, out here in the streets making it happen to change and out here to make a difference, you know. I might be a little slurred because it's the first time for me doing this, so don't mind me, y'all. But um, just a um, quick question. I just want to ask my question now so I won't get off the topic, right? So this is for the brothers and sisters and the loved ones of all. I just want y'all to hear me how I say it, right? Don't get me wrong. I had to get this right, all right? So, <clears throat> right, if, if elected as DA of Manhattan, would you, or, wait, let me see if I got this right. All right, hold on. Mm -hmm. Sorry, y'all. All right, all right. If elected to DA, um, for, um, elected for Manhattan DA, right, what will you do to ensure, ensure, and I insert, ensure youth are treated justicely, you know, during interrogations. What would you do? What will you do? What will you do? And to respond to the question, our first up will be Tahani Abushi, uh, and she will be followed by Alvin Bragg. And he will be followed by Liz Crotty, um, and then Diana Florence, and then Lucy Lane. And Ta uh, Tali Fahadin White Weinstein will not so much bring up the rear, but will be uh, the closer, okay, on this round. There's four rounds of questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lankos, thank you so much, my brother. Thank you for pouring in. Thank you for giving out. I'd rather see a young man on the panel doing what you're doing than on the walk throwing rocks at the people. All right, let's go. First um, one up. Thank you so much, um, uh, Kewan. That's uh, a really important question. And thank you for speaking out about your experience. You know, for me, criminal justice reform is very personal because when I was a kid, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. And overnight, my mother became a single parent to 10 children. So police presence and the destabilization it caused our family is something I know all too well. And that's why, as a civil rights attorney, I spent my career holding the police accountable, whether it's termination, discipline, or prosecution for their misconduct. And I take uh, children uh, have especially a soft place uh, in my policies, in my agenda, because I've been there and I know what it's like to be taken advantage of because you're an easy target, especially as a black and Latino young man. Um, what I'm going to do is in my when I scrap the early case assessment bureau, I'm going to establish an arrest review unit that is going to dissect that moment a cop comes into contact with a civilian. And we're going to take all the information of what the background of this officer is, both in their discipline records, civil rights lawsuits against them, what is the source of evidence, why they came into contact, who is this person that they're restricting and make sure all that evidence is made public so we can use our office as a bully pulpit to make changes. I'm also going to establish a dedicated police accountability unit, unit where we're not just gonna put them on some list because they're lying, we're gonna take them off the force because of those right. abuses. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bragg. Come on, thank you for, um, for sharing, uh, it was powerful. Uh, I, I grew up in Harlem and, and, and I've been, I mean, your question is about interrogation. Uh, I was stopped by the police, you know, more times than I can count, uh, interrogated. Uh, so so I, I know that interaction, three of those interrogations were at gunpoint. Uh, they were all lawless. You didn't need to go to law school to know that. I knew that in the moment. Um, but, you know, it took me, you know, a lot longer than you, you took courage to speak up about that publicly the way you are. So I commend you for it. Uh, but that was the beginning of my advocacy. I uh, filed a complaint after the first gunpoint stop. Uh, and it's centered everything I've done, suing the state police for excessive force, prosecuting an FBI agent for lying, uh, and representing Gwen Carr, Eric Garner's mother, uh, seeking transparency in a case against the mayor. Specifically on your question, I think the last time we were together with some of this group, we talked about 
having a right to a lawyer, uh, a non-waivable, if you're uh, a minor, that's something I've been pushing for and standing up for. Uh, and also along with the Innocence Project, uh, uh, removing deception uh, from these, uh, the, the, these interrogations. So I think those are two cornerstones uh, and apply at all ages, but with particular force uh, really to youth. Thank you, thank you. Liz Crotty, please. Take yourself off mute, Liz. <laughs> I hate to say it, I do it every night. I am a repeat it. offender every night with the Zoom and the not muting myself, I apologize. Anyway, thanks for that question. You know, I am the practitioner in this race. I have was a Manhattan DA for six years. I've been a defense attorney for the past 13 years. I have reported to precincts. I have asserted people's right to counsel live and in person. Um, I understand what you've gone through, and I think that the law has made some necessary changes, starting with raise the age. You said you were 13 when this happened. Now it's 16, 17 years old. The case remains in family court. Second of all, the governor signed a bill in the fall, which required that all um, video, all statements of, under, of juveniles be videotaped. I applaud that legislation, and I think it is to, only to the benefit of everyone involved in the system. Um, you know, anecdotally, whenever I have someone who is younger who gets arrested, I always say, tell, tell them this is their first entree to the civics lesson of everyone should keep their right to remain silent because it is sacrosanct. So I think we also, and, and it usually is to other people's detriment. I think it's kind of comes out to outreach um, in the DA's office and schools and be upfront about what people's rights are and going into the school and explaining the criminal justice process in schools to kids like yourself when you were at 13. So kids are educated as to their rights. So All kids, right. thanks. <laughs> you hit it right there, right? Great sentence to end on, talking okay. about young people in school. Uh, <laughs> Sister Florence. Thank you. You know, six years ago this past Tuesday, a 22 year old kid named Carlos Moncayo died in an unprotected trench in the meatpacking district. That was a crime of power and I was privileged to bring a justice for Carlos going after the developer on site and his direct employer for his death. And what happened to you, Kajan, is exactly that. It's a crime of power. And when police officers abuse their position, they need to be held accountable. And I understand that. As your district attorney, I will make sure that no one is above the law. And that means whether you're a corporate executive, whether you're Wall Street, whether you're a real estate developer, whether you're a construction uh, in company, that you will be held accountable. That also means police officers. When it comes to talking to youth, and even if they are lawfully arrested, which it doesn't sound like you were, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And it strikes me that if, if any one of our kids were arrested, we wouldn't want them to speak without our par a parent present and a lawyer present. So even if the law hasn't kept up, and I just, you know, I, I respectfully disagree with some of my colleagues saying the law has been, you know, uh, protecting kids, because I don't think it has, you know, we're way, be we're, we're way behind in what we're doing to protect youth. So for me, we're going to do what every parent, what every, what every person, decent person would do, which is protect our kids kids and we won't interrogate kids without their parent present or their lawyer. All right, right there. Next up, Lucy Lane. Thank you, Reverend, and thank you for the question. Reverend Breyer said something during prayer that really resonated with me, which was she prayed for the ties of mutual regard. And this really resonates in particular with respect to how we treat children across the city. I created a first of its kind college and prison course to bring assistant district attorneys inside New York's prisons. And one of the great teachers in my life is a young man who was a student in that class, was arrested at 17 for a shooting, released six years later, and is now a law school bound uh, student at, at Columbia. And what I learned from him has really been the fact that raise the age is not enough that we do need to take affirmative steps to protect youth, and that includes ending interrogations. It also includes uh, investment in community-based organizations and educating young people about their rights, and, and it includes ho holding police accountable when they violate those rights. Those are all just a few of the things that I commit to you as district attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And Kali Fahadi and Weinstein, you're up. Thank you. 
Thank you uh, so much for having me. And Reverend, the thing about what was it you, what is it you called it, bringing up the rear, uh, is that we've already heard so many great ideas from my colleagues that I agree with. I think kids have to have parents or a lawyer in the room with them, that police, when they're being interrogated, that the police can't use deceptive practices on kids, that we have to make sure that we are treating kids as kids. So let me just say something different after all of that agreement. You know, one of the things that, I've really been worried about is what about folks who were convicted when they were really young and are serving really long sentences now are sitting in prison. And so in Brooklyn, I built a post-conviction justice bureau. And when we said to ourselves, where should we start when we think about whose cases we can support for parole and clemency, we started with them with people who were young when they were convicted, because we know from brain science, from case law, that uh, age and culpability are deeply intertwined. And so we went back, I sent ADAs up to prison to sit with people, to get to know them and to figure out if we could help them come back home. Uh, that's just one more idea to put on this table. Thank you so much. And thank you. What a group. I'm, I am very proud of each one of you. And we will continue to model the decorum that has been exemplified by you being cogent with your responses. So with that said, I'm going to introduce Jasmine Ortiz from Safe Network. She will address you and then pose her question to you. Hi, my name is Jasmine Ortiz and I am the founder of Safe Network. However, today I am speaking as a survivor of human trafficking, as well as domestic violence. My question for all of you is, what are your thoughts and the equality model, the bill that we just passed, the S-606, um, what are your thoughts and how we fought in Washington to stop pros making prostitution legal and we were able for that bill to pass where, it, you know, um, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and that bill didn't pass. And now they wanna pass that law here in New York. It's bad enough that survivors of human trafficking are still missing, uh, police officers, as well as EMS, um, schools, um, social workers and beyond cannot identify a survivor of human trafficking. So I wanna know what are your thoughts and how are you gonna protect survivors of human trafficking? Because a lot of us have lost a lot. I have lost um, my children. Um, the system didn't help me. So the system, mental health, schools, um, social workers, they, they, um, they failed me. And because of that, now I'm struggling with um, brain trauma lesions. And I'm having, I just got, got diagnosed like two or three months ago. And as you can see, my speech is a little bit, and now I have to do all of this work back on myself. So excuse me, I usually can speak clearly. So, so what it, what are your thoughts and how are you gonna better, especially communities of color? I grew up in a community of color and I, even though my, my trafficking was familiar trafficking, familiar trafficking can be someone from your church, someone from your school, the drug dealer, your neighbor, anyone. And mm -hmm. even me growing up, when we, I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, like the cops, would I would never call a police officer because when a lot, even to this day, as a Hispanic woman, as a color woman, we are viewed as over-sexualized. And even when I was going through the domestic violence and, you know, and I called, I was looked down on. And that okay. still happens today. Okay. And that's my question. And well, and I'm going to just pack it a little bit Yes, and please. Ask, how are you going to treat sex traffic people? Are you going to treat them as criminals or are you going to treat right. them as victims within the context of what you just heard 
and I'll give the order. Uh, it will be Sister Tahani Abushi, Alvin Bragg, Liz Crotty, Diane Florence, Lucy Lane, and Tally Fahadi and Weinstein in that order. Uh, Sister Tahani, please lead us off. Uh, Jasmine, I think, first of all, you did a phenomenal job uh, telling your story, um, and I'm really sorry for what you've gone through, what you continue to go through. I have represented many victims of sexual violence, and I can tell you one thing that the system doesn't do is listen to them or even acknowledge their pain. And so a lot of focus is on the harm, and we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every year on uh, criminalization, incarceration, prosecution, and then we leave the victims high and dry. There were times we didn't even get a heads up at what had happened with the case or how it was resolved because we were relegated to pieces of evidence. And so my commitment is to put you first and ensure that we center your voice and understand how we can support you and how we can uh, ensure that there's funding for victim services. And you are part of the decision-making process, whether it's restorative justice, incarceration, um, you have to be part of what accountability looks like. Um, we shouldn't be replacing our voices or our egos with your voice. And so that's my commitment to you to ensure that our prosecutors are trained um, in trauma and are trauma informed. Um, and that again, you have somebody by your side that's in your corner um, as we decide what we're going to do with each case. Thank you so much. Alvin Bragg. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. And Reverend, I'll stay with the, the spirit of fellowship here. I agree with everything that Sister Tahani said, and, and thank you, Jasmine, for your leadership. Um, you know, I've uh, in my career seen the system do this as well. I've also seen incredible sex trafficking. I'm recalling a, a matter we worked on where where a group was, you know, trolling through Port Authority looking for people who had run away uh, from home uh, to prey on them. Uh, and so, you know, this is an important matter. Uh, and and I thought you did a phenomenal job speaking, and that's what we need to do: be listening to you. And I, I think just to kind of add to to what Sister Tahani said, I think we also need to bring these voices inside the office. So I look at uh, the DA's office; it, it is stunningly non-diverse uh, in in lots of ways. Uh, and one of them is the voices of survivors. Uh, the others are specifically the voices. Um, for communities you mentioned. So I grew up in Harlem, similar communities to the one you grew up in. And we've got to center the voices from that experience because those voices and those lives are the one being impacted. Uh, and until we do that, uh, justice will continue to avoid us. So thank you. Liz, party. <laughs> uh, Jasmine, that was a, it, it's really hard to tell your story. I'm still a practicing criminal defense attorney, and, and in the sake of non-disclosure, in the past week, I, uh, just re I just resolved a case of a sex trafficking victim who was charged with a crime, and I spent the be better part of the past two years explaining to the DA's office why they needed to listen to my victim. Um, I have, and she was a victim, even though she was arrested, and, and she was a defendant, so I know firsthand what's been happening. I spent my career working with women like yourself, and and protecting women and and prosecuting and defending these types of cases. And, and when you have a case like the one I did this week, there's two sides to that story. That's what I've spent the past 13 years working on. And I can promise you as the next DA, I will listen to every single one of those stories and understand the collateral consequences in each and every case, because there are no small cases. There are only cases that matter to people and, and that's what I know from being for the past 13 years. Um, and I think we have to really look at what we're doing and, and really know that victims and restore the trust in the DA's office so that people like yourself, people like my client feel comfortable to tell their story and, and trust district attorneys with their story to do the right thing. And you know, it's not about convictions, it's about doing the right thing and listening to people. That's what I've been doing for the past 13 years. And that's what I'm going to do right. as an DA. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Florence. Thank you. And Jasmine, thank you so much for sharing your story. Unfortunately, it's not the first time I've heard your um, situation. And what really strikes me, um, and maybe perhaps my approach is a little bit different. Um, I 
spent my career prosecuting domestic violence and also uh, labor crimes particularly. And I understand that with labor trafficking, it was so difficult to make those cases because of the vulnerabilities of the victims often undocumented. When you add to that, that the trafficking uh, that you experienced also underlies crimes, right? The, the labor traffickers, they were working as construction workers. But we need to be you know, realizing that the vulnerabilities are there and we need to be coming to you. You should, it, the onus should not be on you to come to us. That's what I did. And that's what I will do as your DA, because I understand that, you know, for victims of any sort of trafficking, there is a big trust divide and it is not up to the victim to, to bridge that divide. It is up to us in government. And that's what I pledge to do for you and people like you. Ultimately, if we're ever going to get trust back in law enforcement and in our government, we need to be taking the first step. It's not on you. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy Lane, step on up. Thank you for your bravery and sharing, Ms. Ortiz. I think that since you raised domestic violence, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the devastating murder earlier this week in Brooklyn of a family at the hands of a domestic abuser. Domestic violence should be top of mind for the next district attorney. And I have a comprehensive plan to address it, especially as it has been on the increase during the pandemic. And so invite people to view that at votelucylang.com. I have myself investigated and prosecuted some of the most heinous domestic violence incidents in the city. With respect to trafficking, uh, from day one, Ms. Ortiz, I commit to building a plan alongside you that is informed by your experience and by what it is you want to see. So I'll share some ideas now of what I intend to do, but really they will be informed by the lived experience of survivors. So I'll invest in the Human Trafficking Response Unit and expand prosecution efforts. I will support and champion programs that provide immediate direct service support to survivors. I will expand the use of both U and T, T visas for non-citizens who are victimized by traffickers. I will leverage the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, which seeks to, to allow women out who are now serving time for crimes that were committed in response to their own victimization. I'm going to focus on the prevention of the dissemination of child sexual abuse materials by investing okay. in collaboration with the Cybercrime Unit and the Trafficking Unit and advocate for the improvement of anti-trafficking laws. We'll also commit to Thank supporting you. traffickers Thank and expunging. Thank you. Sorry, trafficking victims and expunging your existing convictions. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, an important note to rest on. All right, uh, Tali. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for your courage. And let me say, we've never met, but. The reason I'm running for this office is for you, because I know that what happened to you has happened to so many women and we have let you down. We have let you down. And that's why I've said from the beginning, the first thing that I'm going to do is build a new Bureau of Gender-Based Violence in this office that is going to transform how we handle so many of the things that you talked about from domestic violence to sex trafficking to sexual assault. And we're going to make this our first priority, and we're going to put moral courage and commitment behind it. And, you know, my starting point on this is a terrible statistic. Half of domestic violence and sexual assaults are not even reported. You talked about your hesitation to come forward. This is part of why in Brooklyn, I led the team that joined the attorney general in suing ICE and saying, get away from our courthouses because we saw that women who were the victims of domestic violence and who were worried about immigration proceedings were not coming forward anymore. That was totally unacceptable. It was making it impossible for us to do our jobs. Uh, Jasmine, today was a very humbling day for me because the National Organization of Women and Sonia Osario endorsed my candidacy. And that was important to me because it affirms what is my deepest commitment, which is to you. And I hope that you and I are going to be able to work together. And I thank you again. Okay. And before I, I bring up the next uh, uh, questioner, I also want to say to you, Sister Jasmine, well, while we are at a DA's forum, Manhattan DA's forum, um, we who believe that the impossible can be made possible, we who pray to lift the arms of those who go forth 
that all of that power is being sent your way at this very, very moment. They may have meant it for evil, but God, God can turn it around for good. I had to say that. I had to come out of my role to say that. So with that said, let's cue up Brother George Bailey from the fabulous Exodus Transitional Community. You've already heard from the leader. Look, he, he brought his own crew up here uh, to clap him up, clap him up. Brother Bailey, if you would come forward uh, and ask your question and uh, through the inspired leadership of our leader, um, I'm going to say that we're going to do something that we have control over. We are going to reverse the order. Now, uh -huh. Yes, 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 yes. That's not a banana peel now. That's not a gotcha. But it, it's, it's fair to just make sure that the flow of information uh, flows uphill and downhill. So, uh, Sister Weinstein, you will be kicking us off. Brother Bailey, come forward and pose your question. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is George Bailey from Exodus Transitional Community. Um, I'm a director in our youth department. Um, my question is, I'm sure you're aware of the many NYCHA raids that go on in our community. What is your plan for how the police handle our disadvantaged youth and will you defer to places such as Exodus Trail Community to continue to create more innovative and effective approaches? Change that question a little bit, but we'll go forward anyhow. What will you do about youth suites in the community within the context of what uh, Brother Bailey just uh, mentioned? And we start with Sister Weinstein. Thank you, Reverend. And uh, may I please ask your forgiveness if, uh, because I'm going to leave at seven, as I think um, I told some of you, I have a pre existing commitment to celebrate Holocaust Remembrance Day on a panel. Um, so uh, I thank you in advance for having me if this is the last time I'm speaking. And George, thank you so much for that question, um, which has so many parts. Let me say, we shouldn't be sweeping up anybody. That's not our job. Our job is to keep the community safe by holding individuals accountable, not for who they hang out with um, or where they live or what corner they happened to be on. That's not individualized justice. Uh, and uh, I, I object to that and I stand against that. And you also asked about supporting Exodus Transitional Services. And I'm so glad that you did uh, because I think that this is one of the really positive legacies of this office uh, that all of us are vying here to, uh, to lead is to direct you know, the proceeds that have come into the coffers of this office back into the community and to people uh, who know best and from their own experiences, uh, how to lift people up, how to support communities, how to make communities more safe uh, and uh, I think it's really a privilege to be able to work in partnership with organizations like Exodus and to support them. And I fully intend to continue doing that as Manhattan DA. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy Lang? I've had the privilege to work with Exodus over the years on a number of projects and admire so much about the services you provide and will certainly continue to support and collaborate with Exodus wherever appropriate. But in many respects, the best thing the DA's office can do with young people is to get out of the way, to stop interfering, to, to stop sweeping kids up and to, to allow kids to be treated like kids. In my view, children do not have a position in the adult justice system that is an area for the family courts when necessary, but really for community-based organizations and for community writ large. So my commitment to you is to work alongside you where appropriate and otherwise to get out of your way because you know how to do the work. Diana Florence. 
know, I believe we need to, of course, support community-based organizations like Exodus, but I think we need to be thinking about crime in our city in a more holistic way. And what that means is not simply seeing violence in NYCHA as a standalone activity. It is the symptom of a deeper problem, which is the defunding of our basic institutions. That means housing and healthcare and transportation and schools. And where does that come from? That comes from corruption that is systemic and has been unchecked. And this current DA has not stood up to power. So part of I, what I believe we need to be doing is making sure that we, we, we hold those accountable that commit corruption, that steal those taxpayer monies, that take those kids away uh, from these you know, systems that they could be invested in. So they should be in, in better schools. They should have better access to um, our after school programs. So while I'm happy to partner and give money after the fact, I believe that the, the greater good and the greater job of the district attorney is to get that money directed where it goes in the first place. So we don't ever have our youth in that situation in the first place. Last thing I'll say, you know what? We should never be criminalizing youth in a way that is unfair. And if, if, if there's accountability, fine, but we need to be treating kids as kids. And I understand that. And overall for me, it's about fairness and justice. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our next one up is Liz, Liz Crotty. I did it again, sorry, I keep muting myself. Um, I appreciate that question. You know, I'm from Stuyvesant Town downtown and born and raised there, um, and I'm from a neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, when I was a kid, there was a gang fight between, my brother was involved with, there was a gang fight under the FDR drive between the kids from, the kids from and I'm saying kids specifically, from Stuyvesant Town and the kids from J Jacob Reese. You know, so I, I understand that there is a difference fundamental difference between being from a neighborhood and being in a gang. Um, I know that because I know where I'm from and I know how I lived and grew up here. So I think we really need to look at um, what we are doing and how we are doing things. I don't think anybody should be swept up in any investigation because they are from a neighborhood. Um, I don't think a Facebook makes a connection of being in a gang. I want to look at things as facts and I think that that's how I would proceed with cases. Um, also too, I think the Exodus program is excellent. We should, we need to invest in, in kids and in, in young people because that is where the district attorney's office, I know as a defense attorney, you can have the most effect for stopping people from getting involved in the system is that we can get involved and say, you don't wanna be here and we do not want you to be here. And the goal is to cut the recidivism. And I think the Exodus pro project and program is really what helps programs like that within the community is what helps the most. And I would fully support them as the next DA. All right, brother Brad. So when, when I was a kid, my, my mom asked me, said, do you know where the drug spot on the block is? I said, yes. She said, all right, don't tell anyone if you're asked. And the reason why she left me that lesson was because she knew what would happen. The police would come by uh, and they'd ask you if you knew and you pointed to it or if you nodded, you could get arrested. Uh, I've never forgotten that lesson. Um, look, I was a kid long before Facebook uh, and social media posts, but it was the same phenomenon, right? It was who you were standing next to physically. It's who your friends were. Uh, and I had plenty of friends uh, who, who were swept up. Uh, now, as an adult, I, I teach a Sunday school class of uh, uh, high school students, and so I'm with them. It's the best hour of my week, uh, and I hear from them, you know, what's going on with their friends, right? A Facebook post, uh, a social media post of some other sort. Uh, that's not uh, a law enforcement strategy that it makes any sense. We need to move completely away from that and not do these cases of guilt uh, by association. And definitely, I want to uh, work in partnership uh, with Exodus. That's kind of where I come from. Uh, my, my mom was a career educator. Uh, my dad ran homeless shelters. Uh, and so investing in our community is kind of what I grew up under. And, and I want to govern uh, in partnership because uh, I know that's where the true strength of our, uh, our communities and neighborhoods lie. All right. Thank you, Brother Greg and Sister Tahani. You know, um, it's interesting because all of my colleagues here jumped into uh, a narrative where this young person of color was already in the wrongdoing of some sort. And I think for me jumping into this race, it was to challenge the premise by which we are responding to the system. And our children of color 
uh, aren't broken and they don't need saving and they're not prone to criminal conduct. Um, and we should stop criminalizing them for being children. We need to end the gang database that has pre-criminalized our youth. We need to end the DNA database that sneaks up and takes their information and stores it in a database. We need to get the cops off their back and have their backs um, when the cops do come from them uh, and tries to destabilize them. And I do suspension hearings for children as young as elementary school. So I hear the rhetoric. I hear when they talk about behavior, not listening, coming from a, a home that is struggling. And all of that is criminalized and, and used in a way that labels them as not only other, uh, but of somebody that is broken. Um, and I think if you look at the safest neighborhoods in our city where kids live and any other place, you're going to see resources. You're not going to see cops and jails. You're going to see resources, after school, housing, you name it. Um, and places like Exodus really should be the rule, not the exception for those that do come into contact with the justice system. Their alternative to incarceration program should be the way to go. It shouldn't be a privilege or something put on the shelf for those that uh, that have connections to it. And I think their reentry program is phenomenal, which is different than parole, which can sometimes trip people up. Their actual reentry program is to stand side by side with somebody and navigate what it means to get back on your feet, housing, job training, education. Um, if you need mental health services, if you're if you're struggling with a substance abuse disorder habit, um, because when you get down into the details of what it means to get back into society and to feel like a functioning person, um, it's these very services. That's what it takes. And so we should invest in that and that should be how we approach our youth. First, Thank get you. out of their way. Thank second, to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm bringing up our fourth question. Um, Brother Mbaki Atiyam uh, from the Dalway Serene Tuba will ask the fourth question. Here you go. You're up, Brother Matt. Take yourself off mute. Sorry. Hello, everyone. My name is Mbaka Cham. I'm the vice president of Nawi Serin Tuba. And thank you, uh, NYC Interface, for this discussion. I mean, this panel uh, gathering up so we can express ourselves. So, uh, Nawi Serin Tuba is a Muslim youth organization that, you, you know, we are here to help the children and the youth, you know, keep their ethic and moral values while, you know, still integrating as Muslims. So, we know, uh, the current Manhattan DA, uh, Cyrus Vance, said he wants NYC immigrants to know the Manhattan District Attorney Office is a safe place to connect to the community services. In light of this, how will you ensure that undocumented New Yorkers can be witness or report can witness or report uh, crimes such as domestic uh, violence without being turned out, turned over eyes? And also, how will you build the trust in our justice system after four years of ICE raids? So I just wanted also to, you know, um, give a shout out to our president, also who want to see our, uh, who, whose name is Serin Bake Mbai, uh, uh, he's in the channel right now, in the panel right now, and also who want to see the, you know, uh, African immigrants being more integrated on, you know, some 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 level of getting here because we kind of feel not here. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We'll go still in the reverse order. So uh Sister Weinstein, I know you have to go, so this may be a time for you to hit it and leave it. <laughs> I, I I'm so happy I got to answer another question and to answer a question that is so personal for me. Uh, Mac, let me say I'm also an immigrant. Uh, I came to the US uh, in 1979 from Iran because of the violence uh, and the instability that was happening there. And this has been a through line in my career, has been looking out for non citizens, for immigrants. It's why I sued ICE, you know, when I told Jasmine about that. Uh, and let me make this crystal clear for anybody who's listening we should not, and I will not, ask witnesses and victims, their immigration status when they come forward. And beyond that, let me tell you a couple of other things that we did in Brooklyn that I want to bring to Manhattan. You know, I've just worked in the Brooklyn DA's office. We're the only district attorney's office in the country, as far as I'm aware, 
that took immigration status into consideration when charging so that we wouldn't wind up triggering a family separation because of the way we charged a crime. We also built an immigration unit because immigrants are so often taken advantage of. They're the victims of frauds and of hate crimes. And our job is to look out for everyone, including for you, including for uh, anyone who's vulnerable for whatever reason. And I will also do what we did in Brooklyn and have people in the office who are immigration law experts so that they can teach everybody in the office uh, how to be sensitive to this, how to be careful about this. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, you know, I'm so glad that, that you asked because this is a first priority. There are 230,000 immigrants who live in Manhattan. Uh, and I think about them when I think about what it means to be a just and fair prosecutor. Thank you. Right. And thank you. And since you have to leave, if there, we, we were going to allow everyone to have all of the candidates uh, a wrap up comment, uh, you may uh, choose to leave us with a wrap up comment um, and we'll go back into uh, the order of the process. Oh, Reverend, thank you. That is so generous. And um, I'll, I'll make it brief so as not to take away uh, from my colleagues' focus on uh, this really important question. My wrap up comment really follows from what I just said. I'm glad I had a chance to tell you, you know, who I am and what my personal history is. You know, I spent 10 years litigating, litigating, I was a kid trying to understand what was happening. My asylum claim, uh, I'm only here because there was an amnesty and I know what it's like to have that system bearing down on you. And I try to bring with me that empathy and that commitment to discretion uh, in everything that I do. I've tried to use it across my career to fight for fairness and safety and justice for every person uh, and those are the values that I hope to bring to life in this office every day. Thank you again for such a serious and important discussion. Thank you, Reverend, and thank you everybody who organized this. Good night. Thank you, thank you. So now we move to Lucy Lang. Thank you for that critically important question. For many years, immigration status was simply not taken into consideration in the determination about whether or not a case would move forward. I'm proud to say that as special counsel at the district attorney's office, I created the role of counsel on collateral consequences to bring immigration expertise into the office and to try to fully understand the consequences of charging people with crimes so that we have a, had a fuller understanding of all of the ways in which a criminal conviction can help so, can, can, can hurt someone. And that is an area that needs to be drastically expanded. The district attorney already has an immigration, immigrant affairs unit, but it's totally monolithic. And it really includes, I think, only one person. Of course, we know that New York City's uh, immigrant communities are incredibly rich and represent a huge diversity of, of the world. And so I will seek to expand the immigrant affairs unit and make sure that it's not a desk job, that there are representatives of the diversity of New York's communities who are out in the community, who are working with community groups to make sure that folks feel comfortable reporting. I will expand language access. I will, uh, I'll implement intake on cases in the Northern Manhattan office and in the, in the Washington Heights office so that people can report their crimes to those offices without having to travel all the way down to the courthouse, uh, run the risk of, of potentially being seen going into the courthouse, which pe some people are so concerned about and rightly. And of course, that they, there will be language access so people can report comfortably. All of this has to be done collaboratively, and I'm proud to have uh, been outspoken on this issue for many years, including advocating for keeping ICE out of courthouses in an op-ed a number of years Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Law, and also advocating for the use of U and T visas for crime victims so that they can remain here. All righty, all righty. Shot past the stop sign. I'm not going to give you a ticket, but I'll give you a warning. All right. I would <laughs> that tickled me. Our next uh, our speaker, Diana Florence. You know, my approach to dealing with uh, immigration I issues is not aspirational about like some of my colleagues. It's not based on policy or things I've advocated. It's things I've done. 
I, as the chief of the uh, construction fraud task force, many of the victims of wage theft and health and safety violations were undocumented. And so the thing that I started in the office was number one, never asking about someone's status. That is absolutely critical. And then if I learned about it, I didn't write it down. We made sure that no one on the task force wrote that down. And we made sure that if their U visas were available, we looked for them. Finally, what I made sure of is that in every single case, if there was litigation, that we move to preclude anyone from asking about immigration status. We need to understand that immigration is being an undocumented immigrant is not a crime. But further, we want to empower people to come forward. I understand these issues because I work with them directly with the impacted communities. And I understand that the district attorney's office is incumbent upon them to make immigrants feel comfortable, not the reverse way around. So my policies will reflect that. Last thing I'll just say, I will not simply um, I will not hire immigration attorneys. I will partner with the experts, the Immigration uh, uh, Lawyers Association. I will have an MOU. So we have a direct line because we all know that immigration law is technical and ever changing. So we don't want to have practitioners have stale knowledge. We want to have it dynamic and continuing. And that's what I'll do. Okay, Liz. As someone who still practices in court, um, Brooklyn and Manhattan are subpar when it comes to immigration. Doesn't matter what they've done. They don't recognize it. You have to beat them over their head to listen to it. Um, I, immigration is a, an issue that I have um, spent a lot of time on. I used to go to Elizabeth Detention Center once a month um, and get people ready for their credible fear interviews. Uh, people who are coming to the United States and is seeking asylum, I would go and get them ready for their credible fear interview, which they have to pass in order to even qualify for asylum. This is not something that I just thought about. This is something I went out and did. Immigrants are the lifeblood of New York and should and of New York, of this country, and deserve every protection under the sun. They, everyone talks about doing these things and they say, oh, we've done them. But you know what? It's it's the practice is baloney, and I don't have a better way to say it because I've been up against it for the past 13 years. And it's, it's something that has to change. It's one of the practices that has to change immediately that I would change as becoming the next DA is really recognizing collateral consequences as immigration being top of them of what goes into how a case gets disposed of and what we take into consideration when figuring out what to do with the case. So thanks so much for the question. And thank you. Uh, Brother Bragg, Alvin. Yes. Thank you, Reverend, and thanks for the question. I, I've spent a lot of the last several years litigating immigration issues, and in particular against the former president when I was in leadership at the Attorney General's office, suing on all three Muslim travel bans, uh, suing the travel, uh, uh, suing on a DACA and uh, family separation at the southern border. Uh, most relevant to your question, we, we 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 litigated against the former president when he tried to. Uh, take funds from the state of New York uh, because we were uh, declaring ourselves as a sanctuary city. So these are uh, front and center issues for me that I've litigated in the courtroom uh, and, and prevailed and bring that, that focus uh, to the DA's office. Uh, in, in addition, uh, I led the Attorney General's work on hate crimes, uh, which we saw was being targeted uh, at immigrant communities. And it also has got to be a full part of the conversation. And we're seeing that uh, today, but really the amount of misinformation in law enforcement on how to bring and investigate a hate crime uh, was something that we tried to address. And as I look at some of the statements, particularly from the NYPD spokesperson last week, misstating the law, stating that there's got to be a racial epithet or a national origin epithet at the scene, that's not the law. Uh, so uh, we need to work in partnership with community groups like our host tonight uh, to address all of these issues. So thank you so much. Okay. And last but not least, Mr. Tahani Abusha. Well, I'm the child of Palestinian immigrants, and my father came here with nothing and worked multiple odd and end jobs to put food on our table, and my mother was right by his side as they were raising the 10 of us. Um, and so for me, uh, immigration issues, it's not some otherization of a community. This is, again, our kitchen table conversation. Um, and so I threw down, I, I was pro bono counsel to one of the first community-based organizations that did DACA applications. Uh, and I co-led the legal team in JFK, where we stayed in the airport for four straight days to fight Trump's Muslim ban until every last person went home. 
And so I'm not only committed to protecting our, our immigrant community, documented or undocumented, but we also have to take a step and uh, take a step back and understand. First of all, it's incredibly difficult to speak your trauma out loud and report it. And secondly, it's even more difficult to say it to law enforcement or to walk into a district attorney's office and say it out loud. What we need is to rely on our community-based organizations like yourselves that are on the front lines witnessing these traumas firsthand and can build, help us build that trust and comfort uh, with our undocumented and documented community to come forward and let us know when they've been victims of crimes or when they've witnessed crimes uh, without themselves personally getting involved. And we have uh, measures like that in the DA's office and with the NYPD where you can report things uh, uh, anonymously. But we have to be careful not to cut out the very important role that our religious institutions and our community-based organizations and our community leaders play because they know these families on an intimate personal level and that's what's going to help encourage them not only come forward but do it in a way that makes them feel comfortable and where someone's in their corner explaining to them what the legal ramifications are, what resources are available, what is absolutely going on and what's going to happen. All these questions, when unanswered, are crippling and really prevent someone from coming forward. So that's what I would make sure to do is do it in co-governance with organizations like yours. All right. Um, thank you. And thank you so much. I'm going to uh, shift over to, to Only Love. And Only Love will uh, facilitate uh, the Q&A um, because we're, we're moving as a... In, 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 in an alacrity uh, fashion, uh, as much as possible, we're moving with alacrity, I should say, um, that uh, she will facilitate uh, the Q&A. And yes, we can take some from uh, the chat and she will then uh, just do the closing where uh, we will have one minute uh, to bring reflections um, and, and last, last thoughts. Uh, on behalf of uh, all who are, have assembled, I want to thank you. I don't want to take up any more time in the transition. I shift over to uh, Only Love. I thank you and good luck to each and every one of you. Thank you so much, Reverend Wyatt. Thank you so much for moderating. So Reverend Chloe, I'm going to need you, um, if you can, to assist with choosing questions from the chat. If we can, we see um, a question being asked here. Um, can we have the question from New York Focus in the chat? And if we can have the question from um, the Tuba Association president in the chat, thank you so much. If you had a question to ask, now is the time to put it in the chat because we will have to be on time for this. So, um, so someone asked, I work with, and I guess this is for all the candidates, but you're going to have to answer in like 15 seconds. I work with the Survivors Justice Project, which works with women who are trying to use the DVSJA law to get sentence reductions because their crimes were in part a result of domestic violence. Current DAs have often opposed these remedies. What will be your policy on reducing sentences of those with DV experiences? And so we will start with Lucy Lang in 15 seconds. Thank you. Thank you for that important question. Not only will I agree to reducing those sentences, but I will proactively seek out cases to which that new statute applies and seek to use it to reduce sentences. Okay, thank you so much. Diana Florence. Yes, we absolutely need to be understanding the, the hows and the whys in each case. And if a woman has a, a background in domestic violence that underlied her crime, we absolutely need to take that into consideration. And again, we also need to be using our conviction integrity unit to um, welcome these types of cases brought to us. We can also proactively look for them as well. So I absolutely agree with us. Thank you so much. And Alvin? Uh, yes, I'm a firm believer in the statute and would look systematically, uh, but I would also add we've we got to stop prosecuting uh, in the first instance. Uh, uh, I've, I've, I know of two survivors offhand who were prosecuted uh, because uh, basically a race to the courthouse. The person who was assaulting them went and filed a, a complaint. Uh, we, we, we can't bring these cases in the first place. 
Thank you so much, Liz. Yeah, I've, I've done close to a thousand domestic violence cases on both sides of the courtroom. Um, I have, I was, my 21 year career spans over these cases. You know, they are complicated, they are messy, they are two sides to every story. And we have to be cognizant of that. And we have to look at each and every case on a case by case basis, because there is no one case that's alike to the other. And I know that they're very, that we have to give a, a case by case look to these. Thank you so much, Diana. I went already. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry about, oh, it's two because you're on twice. Tahani? Um, I absolutely agree with my colleagues uh, and support reducing sentences for victims um, of domestic violence. And I think Tracy McCarter's case is just a prime example of what happens when you isolate that out of the context. Um, and we have to bring that voice back in and ensure that we're seeing this from the full context, not from the lens we want to see, because it allows for a conviction at all costs. Thank you so much. Now, our question from New York Focus. The Special Narcotics Prosecutor is a citywide office devoted solely to prosecuting drug felonies. Since 2005, the earliest year for which complete records are publicly available, the office has prosecuted over 20,000 individuals and secured thousands of prison or jail sentences. What is the relationship between, and I am sorry, it's just- this. What is the relationship your office yeah. have to the special yeah. narcotics prosecutor and the, to prosecuting crimes related to the sale and use of drugs more generally? Okay, thank you. And we will start with Tahani. Yep, so uh, I've committed to advocating for um, disbanding the Special Narcotics Prosecutor's Office, uh, doing away with it. Um, we have uh, about over 50 uh, assistant district attorneys from the Manhattan DA's office serving in that office, and I will pull back. I think it just furthers the failed war on drugs that have torn down Black and Latino communities. Um, and have done nothing to invest in them and build them back up. Um, so I think uh, it's extremely important to not add an additional layer of incarceration, prosecution, and police presence in our communities, especially when we have just the New York City, five DA's offices, the AG's office, the U.S. Attorney's office, uh, and uh, multiple law enforcement agencies and, and units uh, in our city as well. Yes, thank you so much. And Alvin? Uh, this office is a undemocratic relic from the past, headed up by uh, someone who's uh, not elected. Uh, if I'm DA, I want a complete control of my docket uh, so that I can approach uh, drug trafficking. Uh, serious cases like I've done in my, in, in my career, we're focusing, tracing the money back uh, to the heads of organized uh, organizations like I have and to deal with addiction as a public health issue. Uh, so I'm for uh, uh, disbanding the, the special narcotics prosecutor for that reason. Thank you, Diana. The fact is the special narcotics prosecutor has unique jurisdiction, it's citywide. And if you understand trafficking cases and you understand enterprises, I've done many of these, then it's important to use that jurisdiction to target the large scale crimes that they have jurisdiction over. So that means a large scale narcotics trafficker or an international trafficker will have a warehouse in, in the Bronx, but a distribution site in Manhattan. We need that special narcotics prosecutor to be focused on those types of crimes that destroy communities. Also pill mills and doctors. We shouldn't be doing low level crimes by and bust or a relic of the past. And as DA will make sure that special narcotics does those wholesale large trafficking cases, which will free us up to do the crimes of power that I've talked about in other my remarks. And that's where I stand on the special narcotics prosecutor. Thank you, Lucy. I'm in favor of a public health approach to substance misuse. And as some of tonight's organizers know, one of the great privileges of my campaign has been working with an advisory council of interfaith leaders uh, to identify issues and ultimately to work together to build a plan for a public health response to substance misuse and to mental health challenges. Because faith leaders over and over were saying to me, we know who in our community is suffering and we know that what's going to happen is they'll get wrapped up in the criminal justice system if we report it. So we really need to move towards a Portuguese model that responds to people who are suffering with a clinical public health response. And that's what I commit to doing as district attorney. 
Thank you, Liz. Oh, unmute yourself. I am the worst offender. Shout out to my friend, Sam Mellons. I owe you a phone call. How you doing? My stance on the, uh, on the, the special narcotics prosecutor has not changed. I think it pr proves a vital uh, part of prosecution here. Uh, in February, they busted a ring that had, 80, that had 86 pounds of fentanyl. Fentanyl kills people. I have responded to a drug overdose where two people overdose on fentanyl. I, I support the special narcotics officer. I do believe when appropriate, however, if somebody has a substance abuse problem and they want the help that we should provide that help and the support for them go to go get that support. But I also know from my own clients and who I have talked into going to, or convinced to go to rehab, I think that holding people accountable is, is part of the process. And I think people do better sometimes when you hold them accountable. Um, and I, I would support that as the district attorney and I would support the special narcotics uh, prosecutor. Thank you. And this is the final question. And then we're going to transition to final statements. But I want everyone who's attending, please look in the chat on Facebook, but here on Zoom for some valuable links so you can read more about the candidates positions. So this is from Nawada Sering Tuba, which is a Sufi Senegalese Muslim organization here in New York City. And this is from their president. And we want to thank their president and Baki and the whole um, organization for partnering with us on this important forum. He said, one of the people from my community is locked up and he's going through trial. The government in Senegal is accusing him of being a terrorist, which is false. They're about to send him back home, which is very risky for his life. He lives in New York and all he did was criticize the way our government's president is leading our country. Is any help available? And I'm not sure if this, the candidates can answer, but Reverend Chloe, I'm gonna, all, you're not a candidate, but you probably know where help is available. So we're gonna start with Liz. And if we, everyone could be brief, and then after the candidates, I'm going to just quickly turn it over to Reverend Chloe. But Liz, any thoughts? I mean, I'm sorry, if I understood the question correctly, his friend is in New York or is in Senegal? His friend is in Baki? Is that yeah, it's a Senegalese brother who is an activist who is in Senegal. I mean, who is in New York here, and uh, he was criticizing the government. So uh, this is how the consulate works. So the consulate get him arrested under uh, saying that he was a terrorist. So when the FBI arrested them, they realized he wasn't, but he, they couldn't let him go. So he was transferred to the ICE. So right now he's in uh, 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 immigration detention, probably somewhere in New Jersey or in, in downtown. And we're trying to figure out how we can uh, you know, get him. His wife is here, his five children are here. Okay, well, my suggestion, if I got the phone call, I get phone calls like this all the time. I would reach out to federal defenders. Um, they're a pro bono organization. Um, that does federal cases. And they do have an immigration facility as well. And they do go into, um, a, they go into the ICE detention centers in Elizabeth. I don't know if he's in Elizabeth or Queens, but I would reach out to federal defenders um, and see if you can't get him a lawyer because it sounds like he needs a lawyer um, as soon as possible mm -hmm. to bring his case to at least um, expand to fight the extradition order. And that would be my suggestion. Um, and if there wasn't, uh, if federal defenders couldn't do it, I do know that there are different immigration projects where they do have pro bono counsel, but it sounds like your friend needs a lawyer Im immediately. Yes, and we are so sorry to hear about this injustice. We are so sorry, but thank you, Liz, for responding because it isn't, these are some cases that will come to, you know, people may reach out to the DA's office. So it's great to know the reaction. Tahani, any thoughts about this question? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, um, as a lawyer myself, the trigger is uh, get a lawyer ASAP uh, and ensure that mm -hmm. your communications are protected, things are documented and that you're, you're seeking um, that legal guidance. Um, we can all tell you different avenues here, but once you have a lawyer that's dedicated to mm -hmm. this case, you can really work one-on-one -on -one with figuring out uh, the pathway forward that is best for him. 
Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I know how these cases are, especially um, for Muslims to be accused of terrorism and to be dealing with that um, uh, is, um, it's more than just an injustice, but you definitely need a lawyer yesterday. Yes, yes, and I agree with that. And Diana, what would you say? Yeah, well, a, a situation like this is precisely why, as I mentioned in my last um, answer, that we need a direct uh, partnership with AILA. And AILA is the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And this is a, and this is a group of lawyers that specialize in all sorts of types of, of, of subspecialties in immigration. You know, they're very complex issues that are ever changing in immigration law. And it, we need to have that nexus between the immigration bar and the criminal bar, because I don't know what, you know, your friend is charged with criminally, but I do know that there are some very complex issues here that need to be held um, obviously very delicately, they need to be handled delicately. So, you know, as DA, we'll make sure that, you know, if immigration issues are part of a case, that they need to be handled appropriately and with representation. Thank you. And Lucy? A great resource that I've referred folks to in the past is a nonprofit called Immigrant Justice Corps, um, which is an outstanding organization of immigration trained lawyers. Uh, so I would encourage you if the federal defenders for some reason don't work out to consider looking there. And I think that it opens up another question here, which sounds like a real potential abuse of power. And knowing nothing about this case, I can say that one of my commitments as district attorney is to building a robust public corruption unit that will include investigations into officials who abuse their authority. Whether that is the case here is hard to know from the facts before us, but there is absolutely nothing that undermines the public trust more than when elected officials or appointed officials abuse the citizens who are relying on them. So we need a district attorney's office who is going to take seriously um, misconduct by officials and who's prepared to investigate and hold accountable people who abuse their power in official positions. And I am that district attorney. Thank you. And Liz, how would you answer this question? Same as last time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I already went sorry I was making a joke okay that's okay I think Alvin's not. Alvin yes you are the last sorry. one I, I, I'm, I agree I'm on it. social work mold I'm sorry I'm that's texting okay. Bucky resources so it's this is a real, yes sorry no, but. and and I, I agree with Liz I federal defenders would be our first call I think from the question I heard that there may be some impact on children and to the extent that that mm -hmm. that is true and we're talking about children uh, and possible immigration issues. I would I would add to the list uh, uh, Safe Passage. Um, I'm a professor at New York Law School at Safe Passage as a project there. And so uh, to the extent that's an issue, and I'm happy if you want to reach out, I can connect you uh, to someone who can be a resource there. Thank you so much. And because I am a social worker and a minister born and raised in East New York, we're going to take a moment because this is a real question in a real family. And I do a great, I am, you know, I love my African brothers and sisters and black immigrants do not get enough attention. Reverend Chloe, um, can you and Baki connect about new sanctuary possibly? Okay, so I'll get you all, you all are connected. I just, we could not end without making sure that we respond because this is a forum for people directly impacted by the issues. This is not a forum for people who just think and talk about the issues. So I had to take a moment to do that. So, um, and we will keep the family in prayer and also in action. So now what we want to do is just, um, if you could each take just 30 seconds and give a closing statement, why should, Manhattan, you know, folks vote for you as the next DA. Why should that happen? And so we will start, um, Tylee had to leave. She gave her, her statement, but we're going to go to um, Lucy. Why should we vote for you? 
Many years ago, I responded to a homicide scene in which two masked gunmen had stepped out from behind parked cars and opened fire, shooting five people and killing one. Over the course of a long investigation, I became close to the mother of the young man who'd been killed, who was then raising her three-year-old grandson. Ultimately, the perpetrators were identified, they were tried, and the day after the jury returned a guilty verdict, I called the mother of the young man who'd been killed and asked her how she felt. And she said, I slept all night for the first time since my son was killed. But when I woke up, all I could think about were the moms of those two boys, referring to the two men who'd just been convicted of killing her son. And it makes me think of the ties of mutual regard that, that Reverend Breyer referred to when we first began tonight. And what we need is a district attorney who sees that, who sees a, takes a 360 degree view of the system. That mother's approach, especially to me as a new mother than myself, inspired me to create the college and prison program that I described that brings assistant DAs uh, into prisons to work on justice reform issues alongside incarcerated New Yorkers. And it is that kind of mutual regard that I will bring to leadership at the district attorney's office. And I would be thrilled to have your support. Okay, thank you. And if candidates can stay within 30 seconds, we appreciate everyone's time. If we can have Diana give your why should we vote for you? Thank you. You should vote for me because my work is my heart. And I spent 25 years not working for, but side by side with impacted communities, whether they were domestic violence victims, tenants, workers, or immigrants. I understand the work and how when we do it the right way, we can transform people's lives for the better. I've maintained relationships with my survivors in the, my cases. And I understand that together, we if we want to fix a system that is inherently broken, that has systemic racism and sexism and inequality based on, on income level, that we can't do it alone. I have done this work together with the community and I will continue to do that. Thank you. I would love your support. Thank you. And if we can hear from Liz. Thanks so much for having me tonight. It's been a real pleasure. You know, I come at this a little differently from my colleagues because, you know, I really th do think the job of the district attorney is to keep victims safe and to keep New York City safe. And public safety matters. It matters to me and it's the cornerstone of my uh, campaign. I talk about it in every uh, forum and tonight I'm not talking about it till the end, but I think public safety matters and I think we need to protect all people in every in every neighborhood to have a safe environment, to have a safe neighborhood and to keep everyone feeling safe. That is what I'm doing here. I appreciate that's why I'm in this race. I am the practitioner. Knowing how to do that delicately from both sides of the courtroom is what drives my campaign. And, and I, it was really great to be here tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I apologize for the noise. Um, um, Alvin? Thank you. We, we need someone who's uh, done the work. I've litigated the most complex cases I've actually brought public safety. I've overseen a large office, but most importantly, I've lived this work. Uh, father of addiction, I know, I know those issues. Uh, brother-in-law who lived with me post-incarceration, I know re-entry issues. I've had a knife to my neck, a gun to my head. I know public safety issues. I've had the police stop me lawlessly at gunpoint three times. I know police accountability. This is not just my work. This is my life's work. And that's what we need in our next district attorney. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Tahani? Yeah, you know, when my parents stood trial in Brooklyn, there were, my uh, siblings and I were the leverage. And there was a moment in the courtroom where the judge asked the prosecutor the question that was on my mind. He said, what are you going to do with all these kids? And without hesitating, she said, they're not my problem. And she kept it moving. And that was the moment I realized the system didn't see us as human beings. They didn't see us as families. And they were in the business of throwing us away. That's what inspired me to become a lawyer. And I came right back to the communities that raised me and fought like hell to ensure that not only our rights are protected, but we hold these systems of authority accountable. And that's what I've done, whether fighting against racism and discri discrimination, taking on Trump, taking on the NYPD. For the last 10 years, I've spent my time in people's living rooms across the city, taking on some of the most powerful agencies. 
And that's what I commit that I'll continue to do as the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Because when we talk about systemic racism, we're hearing things that sound good now, but there are issues that our communities have been dealing with long before it was ever popular to say out loud. And so it's time we elect somebody that has walked in the shoes of those communities impacted by this office, someone that has lived our experience to know what it's like to be judged by the color of your skin and your appearance. That's what's going to make all the difference in this race. Thank you. And thank you to all the candidates. We appreciate you being here with us. Um, we, we truly appreciate all the attendees and all the partner organizations. Before we have my brother Baki close us out in prayer, I do want to talk about some important next steps because this um, is one of many forums and actions we will be taking. We want to invite everyone to vote on June 22nd in the primary. Please educate yourself on rank choice voting, and we will have opportunities for you to be educated on that. Um, for faith leaders, join us on April 20th at 1 p.m. as the MICA Institute in the Interfaith Center of New York brings together a very diverse group of faith leaders to start developing our platform for racial justice. So if you want more information about that, you can email me, but also we will be following up with, um, with some information so that you can stay engaged and get your faith communities engaged. And please stay tuned for our mayoral candidates forum with Union Seminary, New York Board of Rabbis, Hindu Society of North America, Sadhana, and also the Buddhist Council of New York City, and also stay tuned for our Youth Mayoral Candidates Forum, where um, interfaith youth are coming together to plan a forum by them and for them. And so with that, I just want to, again, thank everyone for coming. And we just ask that everyone please vote with your community in mind. And we wanna thank Exodus Transitional Community and all those who are face-to-face um, in the center. And again, we thank everyone who attended. And now I'm going to turn it over to my brother, Baki, to close us in prayer. And the founder of his faith community was the first person to start a nonviolent social movement. Actually, a Senegalese Muslim man in the 1800s led a nonviolent social movement against French colonialism. So that is Black history that we all should know. And so, Baki, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to you to close us out in prayer. And we will be following up with all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Only Love. Thank you so much. It was a great, great, you know, meeting all the candidates and wishing you all the best. I'm praying God the Almighty to give us peace and protect our family and protect her, you know, the candidates and give us the best candidates so we can have a peaceful and just you know, uh, justice in, 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 in Manhattan and also to help us flourish in uh, everyone, the citizens, immigrants, uh, permanent residents. I'm also uh, praying for God to give what we all desire, which is peace and happiness, and also protect us from this pandemic. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, and good night, everyone. Thank you.